He is a Denver native born of Denver natives. A former Denver chief deputy district attorney. He is now an active Colorado trial lawyer. Bright, independent, and full of fun. He has been part of the media for decades. This is The Craig Silverman Show. Oh, what a world, what a life, what a day. Saturday, September 16, 2023. More significantly for me, and perhaps many of my listeners, Happy Rosh Hashanah, the year 5784. It's not like I'm a great Jew, but as you will hear in my discussion with our troubadour Dave Gunders, we do celebrate the high holy days, and a lot of that's passed down through my father. You can skip ahead right now to the best part of the show, which is Dave Gunders every damn week, his music, his wit, But gosh, we have great guests this week. I want to tell you about them. I want to talk to you about Lauren Boebert and what happened at the Denver Cultural Center. Does it have culture when she's getting felt up and feeling a guy, I don't know, probing for the deep state? Congresswoman, Mount Blue Sky has replaced Mount Evans just in time as we fight back against white Christian nationalism, which is... Exactly what Scott Levin said when he gave out awards at the civil rights affair that Phil Weiser got a nice award Wednesday night. So do Na Bong Sandoval, another civil rights leader. The Anti-Defamation League under attack by Elon Musk. I talked about Elon Musk with Larry Rickman, my boss at the Colorado Sun. I talked about so much more, but Larry knows a lot about the media because he runs Colorado's best news outlet. And boy, have they grown in five short years. And everywhere you look, there's the Colorado sun, especially September 29th at the Tivoli. I will be there. It's the sun fest. More significantly, the governor, Senator Hickenlooper, Senator Bennett, so many important people, especially the staff at the Colorado Sun, starting with Larry Rickman and everybody else who works there. He mentions a lot of them. He gives a great interview, by the way. The guy worked for the AP for a long time. We've had other shows talking about his reporting when the Soviet Union collapsed. There's an AP style that's good. It's distinct. It's like going to Harvard Law. It's prestigious is what I'm saying They don't just hire anybody or give awards to any Joe Schmo, but they gave one to Rich Cotty when he was a reporter up in Montana before he went to law school and came to Colorado to dominate first the civil defense world. He was head of their top organization, and now he's on the other side. Rich Cotty is an Act 5 attorney in Craig's Lawyer's Lounge, That entitles him to the inner sanctum where lawyers in their fifth decade of practice can speak candidly about this disgrace, which is Donald Trump, the defendant Donald Trump, who is acting out like crazy as I record Erev Rosh Hashanah. Erev, what does that mean? Hey, I looked it up. It doesn't really mean Eve because Jewish holidays start when the sun goes down. That's when I'm recording it. Friday evening, right before Rosh Hashanah. It's the day before Rosh Hashanah, and it's significant. Now, the high holy days mean I won't have a Craig's Colorado Corner because I record that on Sunday, which is the second day of Rosh Hashanah. And since I'm not that religious, you may ask, why do you observe the second day? Well, I talk about that with our troubadour, Dave Gunders, who is out playing music tonight on Shabbat, Friday night, Rosh Hashanah night, and we give it that blessing. But my father did not want me working on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, and I will honor that. Thankfully, he allowed us to watch football on Rosh Hashanah and the Buffs and the Broncos. That'll be great. But so is this podcast. It's amazing with my guests and the sound. I wait till the evening to get the best sound, 
to play and comment on it. Lauren Bobert, oh my goodness, that's exploding on Twitter. Follow me at Craig's Colorado. And I've got a lot of wisecracks. Holy cow, back in the day on the radio, we would have fun with that. Now, nobody on Denver Trump radio will even talk about Lauren Bobert because every damn host over there endorsed her in 2022 after her misbehavior was pretty darn well known. But you know, even though we're not going to have a Craig's Colorado Corner for a while because of the high holidays, my new hit panel show that airs on Monday mornings, I am not forgetting about Jack Smith, who filed that motion that I wrote about a while ago in my column in the Colorado Sun. I told them to add up the various posts and disparagements and speeches in Rapid City and Carolina talking trash against prosecutors and judges and everybody else. And they added it all up. They put it in a motion, and it goes like this, as reported by CNN, courtesy of Wolf Blitzer and more so Jessica Schneider, who reads from the motion. Prosecutors say they need a judge to put limits on what Trump can say about this case. What's the latest? Yeah, well, the special counsel's team here in this long motion, they're laying out all of these reasons why they want the judge to now step in immediately and order Donald Trump uh, from make, uh, stop him from making statements online and in person, any statements that could end up intimidating witnesses, uh, court officials as well, or even the jury pool. Now, earlier today, the special counsel actually revealed that numerous witnesses have in fact faced threats and intimidation because of statements from Donald Trump. So now now they're asking in this motion, they're asking the judge to do something official about Trump's words. So they're laying it out this way. They're saying the defendant's repeated inflammatory public statements regarding the District of Columbia, the court, prosecutors, and potential witnesses are substantially likely to materially prejudice the jury pool, create fear among potential jurors, and result in threats or harassment to individuals he signal singles out. Put simply, those involved in the criminal justice process who read and hear the defendant's disparaging and inflammatory messages from court personnel to prosecutors to witnesses to potential jurors may reasonably fear that they could be the next targets of the defendant's attacks. And because of that, the special counsel now wants the judge to issue an order officially restricting Trump from making certain comments. And the special counsel, they laid out a number of social media posts and comments from Trump over recent weeks that have not only targeted the special counsel, Jack Smith, but also also former Vice President Mike Pence, even a prosecutor on the special counsel's team. What's interesting here is that Judge Truckin, she already ordered Trump to stop from making disparaging comments. She did that at the arraignment. But obviously, Trump has not listened. He's continued to post. So now the special counsel wants the judge here to issue an official order in writing prohibiting Trump from naming witnesses, making statements about them, really making any statements about anyone that are disparaging or intimidating. So well, this is really a significant move and request from the special counsel's team here. And even though the judge has warned Trump once at his arraignment, this is the team, the special counsel's team, asking the judge to make this order official. Of course, Donald Trump is not going to respect that. We will hear his response. In fact, let's hear it now via Laura Ingram. Tonight, I happened to tune in and that dismissive exhalation of a giggle or dismissive laugh. It's a white Christian nationalist tool and it's awful. She is awful. And listen to her read the post in response to Jack Smith's motion by her dear leader. Just responded moments ago on Truth Social, Mike, saying in part, I'm campaigning for president against an incompetent person who has weaponized the DOJ FBI to go after his political opponent, and I'm not allowed to comment? They leak, lie, and sue, and they won't allow me to respond? How else would I explain that Jack Smith is deranged or crooked and that Joe's incompetent? I mean, Trump is, he is funny. You have to give, give him that. And then she says that Trump is funny, furthest thing from funny in my book, but it takes different types. And I'm just not down with these Eva Braun ladies like her or Megyn Kelly. I read Megyn Kelly's book and liked her less. Same with that General Flynn. Normally you read a book and you like a person more. But I don't like Megyn Kelly and she's back 
just doing her white Christian nationalist thing with Donald Trump, and she hosted him. But she was a lawyer, and she's got to ask a decent question or two. But first, she lets Trump say, hey, this shouldn't even be a case. I'm allowed to have these documents. I'm allowed to take these documents, classified or not classified. I'm allowed to do what I want to do. I'm allowed to have documents. And frankly, when I have them, they become unclassified. People think you have to go through a ritual. You don't. And this is going to be a case. So Megyn Kelly goes on to ask the former president, hey, what about moving those boxes and these various obstructions? And she gets him to acknowledge that he received a subpoena. And she says, well, you know, you can't, even if you don't like it, once you get a subpoena, you you can't mess with things. And at first he says, I know this. Then he realizes, uh-oh, I just confessed. And he has to say, I don't know this. I have to turn him over. I know this. I don't even know that because I have the right to have those documents. So I don't really know that. Anyway, the guy's a dupus, and part of the reason he won was with the complicity of a lot of people in the media, people that I know, like Jenna Ellis back in the day. She went from ripping Trump on my show to suddenly getting money and attention. I wrote about that December 7th in the Colorado Sun. I saw Donald Trump had tweeted something about Jenna Ellis, and I brought it to her attention because I still have her on my cell phone. And she said, oh, my God, and then she overreacted. And she probably got paid a lot, and she likes fame and fortune. Who doesn't? And then she switched to Ron DeSantis because she may have gotten paid more. My God, DeSantis had so much money. I don't know. Or maybe she, no, it can't be her morals. But the thing is, Kyle Clark is a great journalist. We talk about him all the time, but his report Friday night had a few things wrong. Let me play you the report Kyle Clark has about Jenna Ellis, and it's not anything other than the timing and maybe the motivation that I want to quibble with. First, listen to Kyle talk about Jenna Ellis and playing sound from her radio show on September 14, 2023. Not a radio show, a podcast like mine, only she's got Salem paying her and they distributed her product. A Colorado has had a falling out with her old employer. That would normally not make the news, but he is the former president of the United States and she is one of his indicted co-conspirators. So Jenna Ellis suddenly turning on Donald Trump is a potential dream scenario for prosecutors. But everything that you just said resonates with me as exactly why I simply can't support him for elected office again. Um, Why I have have chosen to uh, to distance is because of that, um, frankly, malignant narcissistic tendency to uh, to to simply say that, that he's never done anything wrong. This week, Colorado Attorney Jenna Ellis, mugshot there, formerly one of Trump's most prominent supporters, turned on him. On a radio show, she said she won't support his re-election. She accused his supporters of idolatry. Ellis says she cannot stomach Trump's malignant narcissism. We'll allow you to decide if that is a new development with Mr. Trump, or if the new development is that Trump has decided not to pay Ellis' legal bills for their trial in Georgia. So here's the thing, Kyle, maybe you don't take Jenna's feed. I do. I like that sort of self-punishment, although sometimes I don't. She tweets nonstop, and she started tweeting for Ron DeSantis really hard about, I don't know, four or five months ago, and everybody took note. I don't know if she got paid or what, but Ron DeSantis had that money to spread around, and she went so far as to question Trump personally and his character before this ever happened. And then insofar as Trump's non-payment of her fees, I think she's raised over a million dollars. She has good lawyer, Mike Melito, who kept her so far from getting her Colorado law license yanked. He used to work for the AG's office. Bottom line, Kyle, I don't know that you have everything right in that report, but I did like that sound. And together we will stay on top of Jenna Ellis, just in a manner of speaking, right? Covering her. 
because she's an interesting Colorado character who I happen to know. And Jeremy Peters from the New York Times called me and said, well, you talked to me about Jen Ellis, and I did. And that led to that elite strike force article in the New York Times, which kind of set the stage for who are these guys. And I had some money quotes about Jenna, including I think the end quote was about once Jenna goes one direction, she goes all in. Something like that. You can look it up. It's Rosh Hashanah. I'm not even supposed to use the internet, so I better turn my TV on right now. I already talked to you about Bobert. I talked to you about a lot of great things, but I do want to tell you that Rosh Hashanah start the days of awe. And those are eight days that God has the Book of Life open and decides what's going to be your fate. Who shall live and who shall die? Who shall become rich? Who shall become poor? That sort of stuff. Is that superstition? I don't know, but it gets you to contemplate your fate. And it's well before Yom Kippur, but as these podcasts happen, we've got this weekend, sun's going down. I hope you enjoy this podcast. And then I work during the days of all, but not on Yom Kippur and not during Rosh Hashanah. So Craig's Colorado Corner is on a, a high holiday break. This is a great Rosh Hashanah treat to put on a show like this. And it's made possible with great guests like my boss, Larry Rickman, like my friend, Rich Cotty. We're becoming friends. This podcast, it brings people together. There's a community of people willing to speak out on the issues of our day. Are you MAGA? Are you anti-MAGA? You know where I stand. That's why you're listening. You're going to like this show. Enjoy. It's hot in here. Did that toaster catch on fire? It wasn't that. You choked on that bite of burnt bagel. Why is everything all red? The heat is unbearable. Where am I? Excuse me, your dishonor. May I step in on behalf of my client? Mr. Silverman, proceed. Tell me one redeeming good thing your client did. He was a faithful listener to my radio show. Not good enough. He had decency and compassion for his family. He did end-of-life planning with Michael Bailey. The Michael Bailey? That is kind to your loved ones. That is smart and way too decent for this place. Your client can go. And what about me, your despicableness? Why should I? Michael Bailey is my lawyer, too. Go on, then. Get out of here. <laughs> now, part of that was serious, and part of that was fictional. But you will die someday, and if you don't make a legal plan, the government will make one for you. Call my lawyer, Michael Bailey. His rates are reasonable, and he can meet with you and your spouse wherever you want, and on weekends and evenings. 720-394-6887 or online at MBLaw. LLC.com. Now back to the Fred Silverman Show. Hey, being a lawyer is a matter of judgment. You have to know the law, the facts, but good judgment is essential. If you don't understand how Donald Trump is culpable for the crimes committed in his name, then I question your judgment. I have the good judgment to question Donald Trump. If you want a lawyer like that, instead of a knucklehead who believes in the MAGA propaganda, call Craig, 303-734-7156, 303-734-7156. I am Craig, Craig Silverman, a voice for victims. Gosh, it's a great honor to introduce my boss at the Colorado Sun. I'm so darn proud of my affiliation there. Columnist at large for my fourth year. I remember the first year anniversary, I believe, was it at the Wincoop in Lodo? Larry Rickman, congratulations on all the success of the Colorado Sun and the amazing changes that are here right now. Hey, thanks, Greg. It's great to be with you. Tell everybody about turning five. How does it feel? You know, uh, it either feels like it's been five minutes or or fifty years. You know, it's there's been a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that's happened. I learned a lot over the past five years, and you know, I'm just just thrilled to to still be doing this important work. I mean, we started off with ten full time employees back in September of 2018, and 
today the Colorado Sun has 27 full-time employees and you know more than a million people come to our website every month we've got you know 125 150,000 newsletter subscriber subscribers and we're just you know I'm just thrilled that we're able to do this impactful important work and um you know it's a it's a tough business it's a it, it always has been a tough business I mean we've lost 2500 newspapers in the past two decades and um I am I am delighted and proud that the Colorado Sun is not only still standing but thriving and continuing to do this good work. Well, you explain it in a beautiful editorial written with your AP credentials showing every time you write anything, and that's a compliment uh, because they have first-class writers. Do you agree that AP writers are recognizable? Um, I think so. Um, I think that's, um, you know, look, I spent 22 years at Associated Press. I work everywhere from San Francisco to New York, and I spent nearly four years in Moscow as a correspondent for AP, helping to cover the fall of the Soviet Union and the rise of a new Russia. And I just worked with some of the most talented uh, journalists in the business at AP. I'm, I'm very proud of AP and still consider myself sort of part of the AP family. Yes, it's a first class pedigree, and I've admired it from afar. It seems to be one of the objective places to get news, and that's few and far between, but I think the Colorado Sun fills that role. Is that what you are aiming for? Well, I mean, look, I was, uh, of course, AP is, in my view, the gold standard of nonpartisan journalism. I mean, AP does not uh, endorse candidates or, you know, do any opinion columns or anything like that. It is absolutely right down the middle, and um, you know, the old AP motto is get it first, but first get it right. And there's always been a, a premium placed on accuracy and integrity. And certainly, you know, I've brought that mindset with me uh, to the Colorado Sun. We all have when we uh, when we launched the Sun. You know, it's, it's you know, I've said it before a uh, hundred times. I'll say it again that, you know, a healthy democracy depends on a free press. There's there's a reason that this is the only industry protected you know, in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. You know, the founders weren't huge fans of newspapers. They got beat up pretty bad back in the day um, by newspapers, which were, you know, generally way more partisan than newspapers we see today. But they understood that a free press was uh, an important element in having an informed citizenry and in, fa and in having a healthy democracy. And I'm um, I'm just proud that we're, again, able to do this work, serve in the watchdog role that the founders envisioned. That's uh, certainly been central to our uh, philosophy at the Colorado Sun. You know, we don't try to be all things to all people. We don't cover the Broncos, even though you know those are important stories for a lot of people. I follow the Broncos myself, but you know, that's not what we do at the Sun. We, we try to do watchdog, explanatory, investigative, and long-form narrative journalism. And... Um, you know, we're not uh, we're not trying to be uh, an all you can eat news buffet. As the name implies, though, we do want to dominate the state of Colorado. Is that correct? And occasionally I'll see my columns turn up in some other publication, maybe toward the four corners. I like that. Tell everybody all the associations that the Colorado Sun has. Oh, absolutely. That was very one of the very first decisions we made. You know, who are we and who aren't we? We decided very quickly that we would be the Colorado Sun, not the Denver Sun or the Aurora Sun or something else. We felt a great obligation to be a statewide news organization, number one, to provide coverage to people all across the state and to travel. You know, once upon a time, the Denver Post and the Rocky Mountain News both had bureaus all over Colorado. You know, the Rocky has been gone since 2009, the Denver Post is, you know, just a fraction of its uh, of its former size, and they've had to pull back. So there really was quite a void left across the state when it came to, to news coverage. And newspapers, legacy newspapers uh, around the state have been forced to make their own cutbacks uh, over the years. So number one, it was about providing coverage in places that you know, weren't being covered or weren't getting sufficient coverage. But number two, one of the important things that we did was we said to news organizations around the state, look, if you want Colorado Sun uh, stories and our photos, take them. 
you know, all we ask is is that you um, identify where the stories came from and that, you know, we are a member supported news organization. And, you know, here's how you can sign up for newsletters and and become a member and join with us in this community uh, of people who care about democracy and care about journalism. Yeah, democracy is shaky, and there's a big rift between rural and urban, but I think the sun tries to reach out to everybody. Boy, did you have the blend of stories this week, because I was proud to see the Colorado Sun and Nine News, to their credit, they chased this Lauren Boebert story, and when I read about it in the Washington Post, there's a link to the Colorado Sun, and I like that, don't you? I mean, not that she gets in trouble, but that people recognize the Colorado Sun is going to be all over any activity touching on Colorado, especially if it happens right in Denver. Absolutely. Again, I'm just really proud of the work that we do. I mean, we've we've been recognized with dozens of awards and, and whatnot, and we don't do this uh, this work for awards, but it what it does is it underscores that we've become a trusted news source for thousands, tens of thousands, more than 100,000 uh, Coloradans and people around the country are uh, recognizing that as well. We've, we've been um, approached by news outlets around the country that are interested in, in what we do and how we do it. And they want to learn from us. And, you know, we're just we're, we're happy to help. And we're we're proud that we've become a, a go to trusted news source for so many people. Sounds like it's time for a celebration, don't you think? <laughs> Absolutely, we're uh, we're planning to uh, to have a big uh, a big bash at the uh, Tivoli on the Auraria campus in downtown Denver on Friday, uh, September 29th. We've been dreaming about this, frankly, since we launched the Colorado Sun to to have a day long festival where we could bring together Coloradans, you know, of all political persuasions and and um, ideologies and whatnot, and you know, come together, you know, under a common theme, which was for a better Colorado. We might not agree on what a better Colorado looks like, but, you know, reasonable people can agree that we want this state to be the best it can be. And let's talk about that in the context of politics and policy and water and wolves. And, you know, we're even talking to a mosquito expert. Uh, it, it should be a, a, a really fun day of discussions. We expect hundreds of people there. The governor will be there. Both of our U.S. senators will be there. And uh, it's just going to be a, a, a great day with a lot of conversations. Again, we dreamt about it five years ago. COVID came along and made that kind of difficult. But we're back at a place now where we feel like we can we can do this kind of thing. And the Colorado Sun is part of our public mission to convene these kinds of conversations. So it should be, should be an informative and fun day. No kidding. I'm going to be there. I'll be the guy with the Colorado Sun hat on. You know, <laughs> get, tell everybody where they can buy Colorado Sun swag. It's all available. Really just going to coloradosun.com, right? Absolutely. Yeah, coloradosun.com, I believe, uh, slash store. But there's definitely a link on our site. And yeah, I love my Colorado Sun t-shirt. It's uh, been worn and washed many, many times over the past five years, and it still looks great. You know, it's funny. Um, I've had to learn a lot, as I said before, about uh, about a lot of things, you know, running a business and getting this Colorado Sun up and running and keeping it going for five years. Also, I had to learn about T-shirts because, you know, people wanted to have Colorado Sun T-shirts. And it turns out that you can buy really cheap T-shirts and slap your name on it, or you can spend some extra money and get really nice T-shirts that feel good and don't fade the first moment you uh, you wash them. And, you know, I said way back then, five years ago, look, if we're going to put our name on something, I want it to be quality. You know, we bring quality to everything that we do, to our journalism, to everything that we do. And I want our T-shirts to uh, to be the same type of quality. And I'm I'm thrilled when I walk through Costco or on the 16th Street Mall or something and see people wearing a Colorado Sun T-shirt. It's, it's, it's kind of fun. Yeah. It is. And honest to goodness, I've never heard anybody say anything bad about the Colorado Sun. I'd punch them if they did, but I think it's a great venue. And it's not just that the senators and the governor are going to be there. I noticed that every prominent public figure has used your opinion page. I'm sure you're the gatekeeper, 
But my God, the people you've published, you must be pretty proud of that, that people from both sides want to get their message out through your opinion page. Yeah, I'm extremely proud of that. I mean, honestly, we had a lot of debate early on about whether we should have opinion columns at all. The Colorado Sun is strictly nonpartisan. We don't make endorsements. We don't try to tell people how to think or who to vote for or any of that. But I do feel that it's an important part of our mission of public service to provide a, a town square where you know people of all political persuasions and faiths and whatnot can share their thoughts. I mean, we're a very diverse state. And I think it's important for us to have a place where people, even if they might disagree with each other, they can have a respectful conversation without without shouting, without flame wars and do it in a way that's fact checked. And, um, you know, it's um, I think it's been it's been a great place for us to uh, to share um, thoughts on the topics of the day. And speaking of respect, you have respect for the consumer because there is no paywall. Sure, they will ask for a donation. The son needs money to pay people like me. And thank you for having an opinion page. By the way, I haven't given up my day job, but it's good to be motivated and to be respected and to be affiliated with the Colorado Sun. And you announced that the whole structure of the business of the Sun is changing. You're going to nonprofit status. So is this a good time to ask for a raise? <laughs> well, you can always ask, but nonprofit <laughs> and news business mean you know there isn't a, there isn't a whole lot of money to throw around. So we we appreciate your uh, contributions to the Sun, but hope you'll be patient with us. But you know, in, in seriousness, we um, we're we're really excited about uh, moving to a nonprofit structure. I've said again for the past five years that if it makes sense for us to be nonprofit, we'll we'll be nonprofit. The Sun until now has been a public benefit corporation, which I, I do think represents uh, our values and whatnot. But it, a lot of people don't understand what a public benefit corporation is. And it's a for-profit entity that, that you know, uh, works to improve, uh, you know, our state. It's, it's, you know, public service is woven into the very DNA of our company. But it was a hard thing for some people to, to understand and for us to explain. And frankly, um, there are some people and some philanthropic groups that will not contribute money to a for-profit entity. And um, from my perspective, you know, nobody created the Colorado Sun. I certainly didn't create the Colorado Sun to line my pockets. And I'm a, I'm a capitalist. There's nothing wrong with making money, but that's not what the Colorado Sun is. I mean, frankly, when you look at the hedge funds that control most of the newspapers in the United States, that's all they care about is generating money. You know, so they slash their staffs, they jack up the prices, they um, do everything they can to squeeze every last penny out of these properties. That's not why we created the sun. We created the sun because Coloradans deserve more. They deserve better than hedge funds are willing to give them. And to me, this new nonprofit status, um, once we have you know, navigated all of the, the hoops and whatnot that, uh, that the feds have laid out, once that happens, um, I, I think it very well represents who we are, our mission and our vision of, uh, of the Colorado Sun and, and why we exist. You know, from my perspective, this has always been about the people of Colorado. So when we become nonprofit, of course, nobody owns a, a nonprofit. But, you know, I like to say that we belong to Colorado. That was beautiful. And when you said I did not create the Colorado Sun, I was hoping you'd finish that sentence because it's my recollection you did create the Colorado Sun. And you finished it by saying, not just make money like all Dean Capital. And you were one of the world's great spokespeople about the dangers of hedge funds to our democracy. And you make your point beautifully, Larry. When people hear nonprofit, they think, wow. Now, when I pay the Colorado Sun, will it become tax deductible? Do you know? Well, yes, eventually. As I said, we have filed our paperwork with the state of Colorado. So we created uh, a nonprofit, the Colorado Sun. We are uh, we have submitted paperwork uh, to the IRS to be recognized as a tax exempt organization. And, you know, look, you're dealing with Washington. You're dealing with the feds and the IRS. So these things take time. So it's going to take a little while. 
for all of that paperwork to get sorted out and to get approved. But yes, uh, eventually, once all of that happens, um, contributions to the Colorado Sun will be tax deductible. Wow, that's when I get my raise. No, that's okay. <laughs> I remember when I saw you at that first, wasn't it at the wind coop that you had that celebration? Yeah, that's right. We we had a celebration at the wind coop for the first uh, the first two years, and then of course COVID came along, and that was the last time we had a, a big anniversary party. Yeah, but it's so cool. The staff you retained. I know you're excited about some new hires. Do you want to brag about them? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, we we just have a, an amazing staff. As I said, we've we've won all kinds of awards over the past five years, and with a sense of humor. I mean, we're I'm, I'm very proud that we've grown from 10 people to, to 27 and we've just added terrific new reporters and we've got uh, people who help us with events and with sponsorship sales and we just have a great team. But we um, we like to enter uh, journalism contests just to see how we stack up against the competition, against the Denver Post or newspapers, frankly, across the West. And we always enter into the large newsroom category of these contests, even though we were only 27 people, 22 in the newsroom. And um, every year we uh, we punch way above our weight. And in most cases, I think we have brought home more awards than any other uh, news organization in Colorado. So again, we don't do the work for awards, but it's fun to be recognized by our peers for the good work that we do do. Well, your writing skills were never in doubt. It's that good AP training. But as you sort of discussed, you were thrust into the role of being a businessman and also making a lot of ethical and moral decisions, I would imagine. For example, what do you do about uh, artificial intelligence? Have you thought about that? Will you use it to gather news or is that totally forbidden? Yeah, it's a great question. As a matter of fact, there's just a lot of interest in that. And we just scheduled a staff meeting uh, for next month. This is just a crazy busy month for us right now. But next month, we're going together as a staff and really talk this through and develop uh, an AI policy. My own take on it is that, you know, that train is coming down the track. And there probably is a responsible role for AI uh, in a newsroom. But I think we're going to have to put up some significant guardrails and figure out how to use it responsibly. Like, I don't anticipate us using AI to write stories uh, for readers. If you come to the Colorado Sun, you can expect that our journalists who are uh, you know, among the most experienced and award-winning journalists uh, in Colorado, you can expect that, that they wrote it. But you know, are there other roles for, for AI? Uh, I heard someone saying that you can use AI to take um, bill drafts that have been introduced at the state house that might come in all capital letters and um uh and make it uppercase and lowercase to make it a little bit you know friendlier to read uh on the screen so that might very well be an opportunity for ai the associated press uses ai to do things wrote things like uh, business earnings reports and i think they've used ai to do some sports box scores so you know, I, I think that there could be some roles for AI. I think we need to, again, I, I think we need to be cautious. Uh, I think we need to put up guardrails, but I, I don't think we can pretend that it's not going to happen, you know, that it's not going to come into our lives. I just think we have to figure out, is there a way that we can use it ethically to ensure the accuracy? Um, I've been astounded. I've just, I've used AI myself just for fun. For a couple of things and you know ask it to write a profile of the Colorado Sun and it came back pretty pretty good I mean there were some factual errors that it made but you know I've worked with a lot of young journalists over the years and sometimes they will uh, produce stories that have some factual errors and you edit and you send it back to them and you ask them to correct it and you fix it and you vet it and uh, that's what we do in journalism and I think that if we bring that same sort of uh, skepticism and oversight to AI, there might very well be a role for it. And the product it spit out about the Colorado Sun probably took about two to four seconds. That's the amazing part. And it, it was astounding. It, yes. And, and that anti-capital letter technology, 
That could be used on Donald Trump postings on Truth Social. <laughs> and now that he's back on X, he put his mugshot there. And you know I've wrestled with it on the opinion pages. And uh, Donald Trump got me to oppose capital punishment, just like I oppose capital letters. The guy is on my mind, but so is Twitter and Musk. And I make my decisions with regard to Twitter, and I use it to promote this very podcast. I'll say Larry Rickman's on episode 170, and you use it too, but increasingly it's becoming a moral question for me. What about you? Yeah, I I struggle with it. Uh, It's been disheartening to see uh, Twitter um, just getting worse uh, by the day. And and frankly, I'm not sure that I've seen something else that really is able to step into its shoes. That's a challenge. It's a challenge for all of us, particularly in the news business, where you know a lot of people these days are burned out of the news for a variety of reasons. It, you know, it may be the post-Trump effect or COVID effect or whatever it is, but it's just a lot of people are less engaged with the news today. And social media, including Twitter, have been important uh, places where people find their news. And if fewer people are using Twitter or Facebook or threads or you know whatever that might be Instagram, um, it, it makes it a, a bigger challenge for the Colorado Sun and for other news organizations to, to put our stories in front of readers. We can't necessarily count on, you know, if we build it, they will come and just put our stories on our websites and, and consider our job done. We, all of us in the news business, Um, have a challenge of going out to meet readers wherever they are, whatever platform that might be, might be in a podcast, might be in a newsletter, might be in social media or on our website or whatever it might be. But um, the kind of the collapse of Twitter and, um, uh, you know, and other social media has has posed a great challenge for for the news industry. Here's one place where I think people will get over their news hangover. And it might be in my favorite building in the world, the city and county building, Anderson B. Griswold. I had my colleague at The Sun, fellow columnist Mario Nicholas on. He's one of the lead lawyers. That's going to be something. I'm old enough to have covered OJ. And that was the first column I wrote for the Colorado Sun. It's, It's beginning to feel a lot like OJ were the first lines. But this is going to be so much bigger, boss. You know, I... I think if there are cameras in the courtroom and the issue is Donald Trump guilty, not guilty, be it in Denver or Fulton County or wherever, to me, I think people are going to be drawn to that. Do you think so? Oh, I think there's going to be great interest. But I, you know, I just know anecdotally a lot of people are tired of hearing about about Trump or they're tired of hearing about, you know, the the craziness in Washington. And they're just... Mm -hmm. uh, wanting to focus on other things in their lives. And, you know, I, I hear this from people on the left and the right. And, um, you know, I, I, I do get it. It can be exhausting sometimes, you know, at a time when, you know, people are worried about climate change and they're worried about the state of our democracy and they're, you know, worried about a lot of things to worry about in, in life. And, you know, unfortunately, from my perspective, what, you know, we've just seen a lot of people just saying I've, I've had enough and, and trying to you know, focus on other things. I, it, it it is an important part of living in a democracy to be well informed about the people that we've elected, whether you voted for that person or not. But you know they are our elected representatives, and we need to know how they're doing. Are they doing a good job? Are they doing what they said they were going to do? That's part of the you know one of the roles that that uh, journalists play is to be a watchdog on powerful institutions, including our elected officials, and. I, I understand the impulse to turn away from the news right now, but um, our democracy needs everybody to be as engaged as possible. I don't, I don't think there's been a time in my life uh, that uh, news uh, was more important than it is today. Right. And if you want an opportunity to actually meet the people who are in Washington or in the state capitol, it's the Sun Fest, and it's going to be a positive thing, just like the merchandise Larry talks about. It's not cheap crap. It's quality stuff. I mean, these are Hickenlooper, Bennett, Polis. They're not coming there just because they think it's, it's, it's something insubstantial. 
The Colorado Sun was built by Larry Rickman. Who were your co-founders, Larry? Let's give them a shout out, too. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Dana Caulfield, uh, Jennifer Brown, John Ingold, Jesse Paul, Tamara Chang, Jason Blevins. Gosh, I hope I'm not leaving anybody out. I think, uh, oh, Eric Lubers, of course, uh, who uh, has just been so central to creating the tech that makes the Colorado Sun go. Um, yeah, we've just, and also I would be re- remiss if I didn't mention John Frank, who was one of our founders who later left to go to Axios. So, um, yeah, we just, we had a great team. There were 10 of us who, who left the Denver Post um, amid, you know, all of the slashing that uh, Alden was doing there. And we just felt like, you know, news is too important to be left in the hands of a hedge fund. And um, let's try to strike out and do something else. Let's, uh, let's see if we can create a new model for news. And let's try to give Coloradans an alternative. Let's give them quality. Let's give them um, the kind of news that, that they need and they deserve. And I've just been so proud of that. And by the way, uh, Hick and Bennett and Polis, you know, aren't the only ones who will be at SunFest. You know, we have just a whole host of really interesting speakers lined up. And also, you'll see the entire Colorado Sun staff. So if you want to come meet your favorite reporter or columnist, uh, Mike Litwin will be there along with Craig and others. Um, here's here's an opportunity. If you got something on your mind, if you think there's something we could be doing better, more of this, less of that, love to hear it. I mean, again, from my perspective, the Colorado Sun belongs to the people of Colorado, and I'm just a temporary steward of it and uh, would love to make it better. So we'd love to hear from people uh, and hear what's on their mind. And if you haven't been to the Tivoli, boy, you've missed an oasis in the city. It's cool. It's right across from... At the ball center where the world champion Nuggets play. And Larry lets me write about my passion for basketball every once in a while. But what I love about the Colorado Sun is your love of democracy. And I love it too. And we both feel it teetering. Just a final push for the Colorado Sun Fest. It's another expression of the Sun and Larry Rickman's desire for democracy. It's democracy in action, what you have planned on September 29th. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just going to be great. And again, um, no agenda here other than just a better Colorado. Let's talk about it. Let's uh, let's talk politics. Let's talk policy. Let's talk about all of these water, environment, climate. Uh, we'll have some cool, uh, innovative electric cars that are there for people to check out as well. So I think there'll be a little bit of something for everyone. And I personally am just really looking forward to this. We've been dreaming about it for five years, and I'm just just so thrilled that we can finally pull it off. Can't wait to see you there. Larry, thank you very much for talking to me and my audience. Good luck for another five years, or make it ten. My pleasure, Craig. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. He's the best lawyer I know because he's my lawyer. He's Michael Bailey. I think you pioneered this mobile estate planning, and lots of lawyers are doing it now. And boy, are your clients happy and satisfied. It's convenient for the client. It certainly is fun to be able to go visit people where they are, whether it's at your house or at one of the offices, just to make it more convenient for you. And then it's more fun for me because I get to go out and about and meet people all over the place and help them out. What's the website, Michael? It is mobileestateplanning.com. What's the best phone number to call? 720-394-6887 is my direct line. Michael Bailey, that's our lawyer. Trish loves him. I do too. Thanks, Michael. You're welcome, Craig. Hey, everybody, for all of your legal needs, why not start with me? 734-7156-303-734-7156. I've been practicing law in Colorado for over 42 years, and I know a lot of people. And if I can't do right by you, I can steer you in the right direction. My number, 303-734-7156. Ask for Craig, Craig Silverman, a voice for victims, a voice for people with legal difficulties.
troubadour. Hi, Craig. Lashana Tova. Lashana Tova to you. What year is it, sir? Oh, it's, you know, 57 something. 84. We're getting up, we're getting up there. Remember 1984 by George Orwell? Of course. I remember when I remember reading it well before 1984, right? Because it was a book about the future. Seems and, so far and away. And thinking how 1984 was so far in the future when I read the book. I know. But Rich Cotty is on the show, and he's even older than me, almost as old as you. He's a cool cat, born in 54. I want to bring that up, except he brought it up, and he is in my new Act 5 Attorney's Inner Sanctum area of Craig's Lawyer's Lounge. Is it already Episode 5? It's under... No, follow along, because it's a new part of Craig's Lawyer's Lounge. It's for Act 5 attorneys. You get theater, right? Act 5. Oh. The closing act. Right. It's for lawyers in their fifth decade of practice. Oh. Which I am. Just barely, sort of. And so... Old guys like us. Exactly. People who are willing to speak out. Okay. Because young people, they have to worry about their careers, like your daughters, you know... They're in a bureaucracy, a company. I wouldn't advise them to speak out the way we do on this podcast necessarily. Personally, I have no reputation to protect. I know, but I'm thinking about your children. Somebody's got to on Rosh Hashanah. And thank you for conceding that long-running, several-year dispute, which we've had during the podcast, about who makes the, the better brisket. I'm not sure that concession was ever made. First of all, the taste test proved it a year or so ago, but the proof is in the fact that you were coming over for the Trish kit on Rosh Hashanah. When this show airs, you'll be eating Trish kit. All right. Okay. Nothing more need be said. I say it. It'll be wonderful. Thanks for coming over and being our musician. Uh, I love this song, New Last Chance. You thought of it when I said Rosh Hashanah. How come? It's a new beginning, right? Rosh Hashanah is the new year. Don't you have like a flute in that song or a clarinet? It's, it's, it's yeah, a flute? I played that. It's a um, what? Yeah, it's like a. I think it's either a recorder. I think it's a recorder. Yeah, I just grabbed that and played it. That's amazing. Your talent. You're great at the harmonica, which is sometimes called the mouth harp, right? That's right. And what biblical character is associated with a harp? Well, that would be um, like more like a lyre, right? Like King David. King David. Right. Was a poet and a, and a musician. Yes. Who played the yes. lyre. Yes. Right. Very good. What's what Don't made lyre him, at me when you're saying that. It's what made him one of God. I think it's what made him God's, you know, favorite is that he wrote poetry um, right. about his Lord and uh, therefore God forgave his many transgressions. All right, we'll get on to that in a future show. But let me ask you this about the mouth harp. A few things. Do you know who gave it that moniker, that nickname for a harmonica, mouth harp? Oh, someone like, um, I don't know, like O. Henry. Or I don't know. Like that. But you bring up Henry, your father. That's right. Henry Gunderheimer. I never liked the term mouth harp so much. It's a harmonica. Now, that's, that's German. And speaking of my dad, definitely a German instrument. Okay, now, do you have power of harmonica rights from your father, Henry? I concede, I concede all my, my harmonica rights to my father. No, no, what I'm asking is I want to, you sent me as proof of oh, Henry's figure, him my, yes, playing the power. harmonica at age 99, harmonica, Ken harmonica, power of attorney. And can we put it on our YouTube let's, channel? Let's do it. And he's actually playing a song that I, I knew as a child. It's about... Uh, it's a Greenland, it's about a whaling uh, expedition in Greenland. So that's, it's an old seafaring song. Some people may recognize it. You know I, what? Yeah. Our A's producer will insert it right now. Shine. 
That's wonderful. Now, should we call it Henry's harp or Henry's harmonica? Um, that's that's up to you. Okay, I You're like harp because it's Rosh Hashanah. I'm thinking religious thoughts, and right. so are you, right? And Henry's harp has a ring to it. Yes, I like it. Okay, now what are you doing tonight? Sundown. It's Rosh Hashanah. It's a day of rest. It's Shabbat as well. I don't want to guilt trip you, but your parents, your mother's gone, so somebody has to. I'm giving thanks to God in, in the only way I really know how. And how is that? Well, it's playing music in his, in his name at a place, at a synagogue called The Alley down in Littleton's, downtown Littleton. It's a little bar. Yes, I never, I never claim to be a good Jew. I'm playing a gig on... on uh, on, on Rosh Hashanah Eve. And you're a pro. They pay you money for this. And then people tip you as well. You could give it all to charity. And before I get sanctimonious, I think it's okay. That's a great I, idea. I think music is a blessing. And it is a tribute to God. So I bless it. I did make a mistake second day of Rosh Hashanah, which I will not repeat. And I made an executive decision not to do at Craig's Colorado Corner on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. You know, we recorded on it Sunday, and it's second day Rosh Hashanah. It's also a Broncos game. So the one thing I did throughout my almost two decades on the radio, you know what I did? I missed every Jewish holiday, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. I took it off because of, you know why? Well, you felt you owed it to yourself and to your religion. To God. My father taught me. Your father. Just the way I was raised. And he said, if you can't take right. three days off this year, it happens to interfere with the podcast, but not regular work. This is beautiful because it's Saturday and Sunday for Rosh Hashanah. And then you miss a Monday for Yom Kippur. Right. And that's the big one. He's right. He's right. If you can't take off three days during the year, then to, what? to to go in and humble uh, yourself. Right, but what if you have a sports event? What if you're playing for exactly. a CU against Exactly, it's which three days CSU? is the question. Or what in if my you have case, a gig, a gig at the alley? Yeah, well, Yom Kippur I would never do. I would, I would, it, Yom Kippur is it's too sacred. I've tried, actually, in my younger days. I once went fishing on Yom Kippur. It was a mistake. I felt terrible. And what happened? Did you catch anything? I caught fish, but I and I fasted, but it doesn't it doesn't work. It doesn't work just to fast and then go about your merry, you know, uh, you know, merry way, doing whatever you want. You have to go to temple, or at least I'm speaking for myself now. Um, the good thing about being Jewish is you can you can invent your own uh, style, I, I guess. Know. And, right? I, and I'm going to the, this high holidays. I think I'm going to do something different for Yom Kippur. Still take it off, and maybe just some new location. But second day Rosh Hashanah, I had a golf tournament. Okay, for Denver Prep League, we were playing, uh, it was Denver South or Thomas Jefferson or somebody. We were playing at Walshire, and I had to struggle with whether to miss that tournament or not. And uh, my dad said, uh, well, because he loved sports. <laughs> Your dad was conflicted. Uh, but it was like nothing good could come of it. And and uh, I was a pretty good golfer. I wish I improved from when I was a kid. but. I I had never shot out of the 70s. And then at Welshire, the opening nine, I had five birdies. Five birdies. On which, the second day of Rosh Hashanah? You're right. Five birdies on nine holes. I managed to shoot 36, which is even par. But still, I had a commanding lead. Your dad was wrong. Something good did right, come and then There's it. a little phone near the starter house back in the day, a pay phone. And I had, you know, my lucky markers, and I called my dad, and he was at the Rosh Hashanah table, just like you're going to be. And I said, Dad, I just had five birdies on the front nine. That's impressive. Good young tip. And then I shot 46 on the back nine, Had and I lost the match to a guy named Henry Higgins who wore like a felt hat. 
I it fell apart. Like, it's kind of like so, counting your chips in the middle of a no, poker game, right? No, it's the curse of Rosh Hashanah. Or, you don't or do it's that. the curse of bragging about your yeah, yeah that too. Or halfway yeah, through to your father, your lucky markers. But yeah, I'm not going to put on a show on second day of Rosh Hashanah because nothing good can come of it. Wow, we can keep that in mind. And I'm not the best Jew either, but I will give you my blessing on performing tonight because uh, one of my favorites. Uh, and we'll talk about that on a future show, has given the blessing. But I want to talk right now about your unbelievable song, New Last Chance. Did you write it for Rosh Hashanah, or what was it going on in your head? No, as usual, we're, we're kind of, uh, we're, we're making it fit into, into Rosh Hashanah. Well, it's about, it's about a new beginning. I liked the idea of New Last Chance, because there is no such thing as a new last chance, is there? Your last chance is your last chance. So... I was asking for a new last chance, and um, it seems to fit with the idea because Rosh Hashanah is not just about a, a new beginning, but it's also you're you're getting ready to to atone. You're getting you're you're getting ready for the high holidays, right? And next week on the eve of Kol Nidre, we will be recording, and it will be a little more, I don't know, in, intense. Intense, but New Last Chance is such a beautiful song. Let's let everybody listen to you, you talented dude, playing the flute as well. New Last Chance by our troubadour, Dave Gunders. Darken the sun River wide Great divide Me not listening to you at all You said goodbye Not thinking about what I could do Just what I can't Need a new life Feathered and tarred Branded and scarred Seeing you hundreds of miles away Here in my yard Losing ground Breaking down Even the sunrise don't stir me
Michael Bailey, a friend, a lawyer, a sponsor. Tell everybody how you bring peace of mind to their life. So by setting up your estate plan, you know what's going to happen to your stuff when you die. You know where it's going to go, you know who's going to get it. We've got everything in place so we're not running to a court to try to get guardianship and conservatorship as quickly as possible. But then it's an orderly proceeding of things. So, you know, there's already enough chaos with the medical emergency, but the legal part of it and who can make decisions is all outlined. It's all set up. So there's, it's like the the smooth transition of power. That's cool because you can avoid so many problems by having a medical power of attorney and discussing it with a smart guy like Michael Bailey, because who should have this? It's probably somebody close. Who do you trust most among your children to make that call? These are the hard and good questions that you ask every day, right, Michael? Right. And if you ask them beforehand, when you're not in the middle of a crisis, then when a crisis hits, we're not trying to do crisis management and medical emergency and everything else. We're going, okay, we've got a smooth transition of power here. We've got a smooth who's in charge, and we can have that all flow so that we can focus on the care. There are so many things in life that you can fill out a form and save yourself money, save yourself heartache. Some people die out of nowhere quickly, but more often you get sick, you have medical difficulties, so it all goes together. But your system works, it works beautifully. What is the best way to contact you these days? Best way, uh, you can give me a call. My phone number is 720-394-6887. And again, that's 720-394-6887. Or you can go online to michaelbaileylawllc.com. And there is a an appointment page on my website that you can use. So either way is fine. Thanks, Michael. Welcome to Craig's Lawyer's Lounge. Good afternoon, sir. Richard Cotty, attorney at law. How are you? Doing well, Craig. How are you doing? I welcome you to Craig's Lawyer's Lounge, not just to their Rich Cotty, but to a special section kind of under construction. It's called Act 5 Attorneys, the Inner Sanctum. And do you know why you qualify? Why? I believe you are in your fifth decade of practicing law. I don't know that. I've practiced since 1982. What's that, 41 years? Yes, you are in your fifth decade of practicing law. This is your fifth and maybe final act. Um, I'm in my third trimester, that's for sure. And that gives you a certain freedom to let things out. In fact, you almost have to let things out that third trimester. And this is a place where people can really speak freely about fucked up current events. And we can even cuss because we are of that age. Well, we'll try to be classy about it. Totally agree. This is for attorneys and trial attorneys, especially. I know all about your qualifications, but tell everybody. Well, I got out of um, Butte High School, Montana, with political influence only. Social passes enabled me to go from one grade to the next. And after being convicted of uh, being an incorrigible juvenile offender in 1969, I then finished high school, went to the University of Montana, worked as a journalist for three years, law school, the usual, you know, year behind you in law school, the same law review stuff, 25 years plus of insurance defense work, served as the president of the Colorado Defense Lawyers Association, served as a shareholder for the well-respected White and Steel Insurance Defense Firm. Bill Steele's probably the best trial lawyer I've ever met, next to Joe Branny, among others. And we could go through the list. I didn't mean to exclude you, Craig, but we've never had a case opposite one another. And then I graduated from that into doing uh, working for policyholders insured. I've uh, served as president of the Colorado chapter for the American Board of Trial Advocates. We, we promote civil jury trials. would rather have jurors, civilians, handling our cases, not politicians. 
And in a nutshell, I'm uh, probably not able to hold a steady job because here I am working for myself again and everybody else out there, I can represent them. When you see flamenco dancers, as the comedian Lenny Bruce observed, they appear to be applauding their own ass. And I don't want to be in that um, challenging position. Now we've both referenced Jewish comedians and the high holy days are coming up. So that's my excuse. What's yours? I was mentored by Nathan Blumberg, a Rhodes Scholar, youngest dean of the University of Montana School of Journalism, former Denver Post reporter, and like I said, a PhD from American Studies from Oxford. And Nathan Ose had a great saying. He said, never apologize for having high standards. He sounds like a smart guy, and there are plenty in Missoula, including my oldest son. So I know that town, and you reported there. That's fascinating to me. Missoula kind of reminds me of Denver of my youth. You want to know about my youth. You were in Butte, but what are your thoughts about Montana? Well, I was raised in Butte, and Nathan is from Denver. His dad was a physician, and so then Nathan emigrated, of course, up to teach at the University of Montana in Missoula. I was a reporter in the Butte, Montana Standard. It's the daily press owned by Lee Enterprises. And in those days, it was post-Watergate, the new constitutional convention that convened the Montana new legislature. Now it's turned an abruptly right turn which is surprising to me because Montana has been known to be very, very uh, independent thinking. So, Yeah, my son, my son has dived into Montana history and all the mining influence, the Rockefellers and the coal mines. It's an interesting state. And just on the news last night, I saw the impediment to Mount Blue Sky being the replacement name for Mount Evans flows from a Montana tribe that used the name and the federal naming authorities are trying to work it out. So there's a lot of history in Montana. I bet you know a lot more about it than I do. Well, I've read C.B. Classcock's classic War of the Copper Kings, if you want to get a clue into it. Keep in mind that George Hurst, you know, William Randolph Hurst's dad, was one of the founders of Butte. He and James Benali Hagen helped fund Marcus Daly in his adventures into Montana. And so in 1876, he found silver at the Alice Mine. He also found the red metal copper. And I'm getting a little off track. No, you're not. Talks about the yeah, my, uh, my, my, last, 19... my last trip to Montana, I stayed at the Marcus Daly Motel before we played golf. So I'm in digging Anaconda. this. Yes, in Anaconda, what a town that is. Built on well, copper tailings. Oh, and Anaconda. But anyway, that's too much history. No, it's not. We're in a podcast. People can fast forward if they don't like it. I like your Montana history. Keep going. Well, my father-in-law, Millard Hansen, worked on the underground at the Kelly Copper Mine. He was in the 4,500-foot level of the shafts. In those days, you'd have dugans, which are frank fragments of metal that would come shoot down the mine shaft, and the mortality was terrible for the miners. But the slogan in view was, it's a mile high and the mines are a mile deep, but the people are on the level. So that's one thing that carries over. We try to be straightforward. And that's why I like the, you know, the jury system is the biggest detectors of bullshit are jurors. And thank God we have courageous judges and courageous jurors willing to say bullshit when the occasion arises. So thank God for that. The courage of the Jurors and the judges can never be underestimated, and they certainly go unrewarded. I agree. And we're going to get to these amazing trials, and we're going to leave Montana. You made a a smart move to get out of journalism and into law. I like journalism, too, writing for the college paper. And so many smart people went that way, and now they're I don't know, public information officers for fire departments. It's sort of sad. Law school was a great path. Why did you take it? Well, like you, I was the managing editor of our college newspaper up in Missoula, an award-winning one, of course. And then I went to work for Butte, got an AP writing award there. And I figured I can write obituaries, but if you want to make a difference, 
being on the sidelines and reporting is not the same as Theodore Roosevelt as the man in the arena. So you get in there and you get in the trenches and you knuckle and you gouge and you see what you can do to advance things along. So other than being a quiet observer, why not participate and try to move the bar of civil justice forward? You did criminal justice. Thank you very much, by the way, because you represented the people keeping the criminals at bay where people, frankly, should welcome your help and not try to submarine and sabotage our prosecutors protecting us from those criminals out there. As the uh, man in Pennsylvania found, sometimes the criminal catchers have teeth. So we want to make sure that the teeth of the prosecutors and the judges are sharpened and ready to protect us. Anyway, I got off subject. Sorry about that. No, I, not, I looked into that job. I had my professor, Al Schuler on an episode not too long ago, and he turned me on to criminal law up there at CU Law School, interned under Dale Tooley, loved it. They gave me a job, and I, I didn't leave until I was 40, and I only left because I, I lost when I ran for Denver DA against Bill Ritter. But you chose a different path, or how did it develop that you – became the head of the Colorado uh, Civil Defense Bar. Well, that was in 1990 when I worked at White and Steel. I know, but how did you get there? How did you start? Um, I guess I could be uh, puckish and say, you know, dumb luck. But thanks to the generosity of others in the defense bar, and I consider the Colorado Civil Defense Bar head and shoulders above other defense bars in other states. I can't talk eloquently about how smart and advanced and skilled the Colorado Civil Defense Bar is. I was trained there. We went to trial academies. You learn by doing it. You try to respect everybody. You follow the rules because we're big follow rules. We follow the rules. That's what it's all about. And we've got a great nose for detecting BS as well. For example, in the defense bar, you smelled it, you've stepped in it, don't try to feed it to us and don't try to feed it to jurors. Those same values carry through when you represent insurance and policyholders. Juries are great at detecting the feculent fragrance of BS, so let's respect their time. I got into the defense bar because I had one goal in mind. How do I pay off my law school loans? And that was the Westminster School of Law that you and I both attended. You got out in 81. I got out in 82. I'm surprised you call it that. I thought it lost that name by then. Westminster. Well, that's what it was when I got out. Of course, we now know well, the building was that, is... Was that the night school division? or? Did no, you... I was full-time day. The it... law school's at the corner where we now bureaucrats and the professor's office are now where they house the homeless. Right, right well, next to the city and county building. I remember that era. Right, right across the street. Anyway, my grandfather went to the Westminster School of Law. So did O. Otto Moore, who was a great Supreme Court justice. We've talked about him. And my father went to DU Law School, but he didn't call it Westminster then. So what do I know? I went to CU Law School. But one thing that I know when I had time for fiction, right now reality has got me too caught up, but... Some novelists have had uh, protagonists who investigate insurance fraud and all the ways people try to cheat and steal. And I bet you've seen everything, Rich Cotty. That's got to be fun. And it's really appropriate as we move on to talk about MAGA in a little bit, that that makes you an expert at detecting fraud or, as you put it in legal terms, bullshit. Well, I don't know. I remember I in depositions representing insurers and insureds and people being what I called victimized by bogus lawsuits. I'd ask people, gee, you're hurt. Well, how high could you raise your uh, your arm before this uh, this episode? And they'd raise it up high. And I said, well, gee, how high can you raise it now? They only go halfway. <laughs> and then, oh, it's like, you know, you can't make this stuff up. I can't. You can go into it. Everybody has war stories. The one thing about the civil defense bar is the humility. When we'd prevail, we'd say, well, we had better facts. Then when I'd see on the other side, the uh, claimant side, it's where the lawyers had to crawl through broken glass and only through, the, through their own inner courage could they, you know, snatch victory from defeat. The whole difference was, was the EYE 
of the defense council versus the capital I of the other council. So let's bring some more humility into it. And then the better and the very best trial lawyers I've seen on the civil bar, Rick Friedman, and I don't need to get into the names, but these are the giants out there. You ask about one of their verdicts and they go, oh, that. They're not playing any flamenco dancing routine whatsoever. They're humble. They're modest. They move on. And so they're the role models we should adapt ourselves to and not simply the self-promoting, self-aggrandizing, you know, town criers bellowing at the top of their lungs, even through cyberspace. Oh, no. Anyway, I got off track. Oh, no. I'm, I, I've been a member since I lost that DA's race. What was I going to do? I mean, I was on my ass, and I thought about various possibilities, and I, I formed a partnership with my buddy David Olivas, and I launched into plaintiff's work. I think you called it representing the insured. You avoided sure, that label, payment. but but you, you do some of it now. And I joined the Colorado Trial Lawyers. It's not like I've been an officer, but I've been a proud member. I've, I've been met, on the board of the CTLA as well. Right. So uh, I just felt like you were throwing a lot of love toward uh, civil defense attorneys, and I'm here to represent civil plaintiff's attorneys. And to me, it was a natural transition from prosecuting on behalf of people hurt through no fault of their own. I'm just switching the consequences. I'm still prosecuting cases and seeking justice for my clients. So I'm really proud of what I do, and I know you do a lot of that now. Which side is better? Tell me plaintiff side. Go ahead. It's a leading question, Your Honor. You know the old canard, the better the client, the smarter the lawyer. Uh -huh. Since 2004, in almost 20 years, I've been representing policyholders, insureds, and plaintiffs just like you, Craig. And when I look at the overwhelming imbalance of power that the carriers exert through subtle forms of advertising where they're engaging in a subtle form of jury tampering by constantly trying to suggest, hint, wink, and insinuate people are exaggerating or magnifying their pain for money. They don't have any evidence for that. That's simply an old canard where they play on the, as we know, the amygdala of our brain, trying to manipulate people through fear. Well, you and I are science-based. And so is most of 99% of the plaintiff consumer bar. Let's focus on the evidence we have here, people, and not some superstitions and fears. Now, For example, I, yeah, now, I you're say, preaching, now you're preaching to the choir. Keep going. Well, you know, you could get people to admit that uh, based upon a reasonable degree of probability that the dark side of the moon is made of green cheese. You say, well, what proof do you have of that? And they say, well, prove me wrong. And then they get into this what about is more shit. Well, wait a minute. We asked you a specific question. Well, we've never seen the dark side of the moon, so you can't disprove it. That's not called science. That's called superstition. And that's why the judges routinely broom that sort of BS out of court. Like I said, we're science based. We want facts. We want empirical evidence, not simply this rumors and, well, I heard it here. That's what Joseph Goebbels said. Well, let's plant the big freaking lie out here and say it often enough, and what do you know? People will adopt it. Uh, no, that's not how the courts of law work in this country so far. All right, before we leave them alone, I just get a little ticked off every time I see those inane Liberty Mutual or Progressive commercials because I know how tight they are with the money when somebody gets hurt. They assume that the person is faking unless they have, you know, a clear fracture. And even then they try to lowball you. And that's just kind of built into the culture. But maybe I'm imagining things. You came out of the belly of that beast. What really goes on on that side? Is the, is the well, default presumption that everybody's a fraud and we're going to lowball them? And don't people get bonuses the less they pay out? Well, that's the culture that they adopted within the insurance industry. You've got four parts of the insurance, actuarial marketing. You've got your uh, indemnity and underwriting, and you've got your claims. Now, everything is from actuarial marketing and, over, and business. You know, you're supposed to get a profit. We get that, but not from claims. That's where you pay it out here. 
And that's when they engage in what I call economic date rape, when the insured asks for the benefits they've pre-funded with their premiums, ask for it in advance. It's a slice of time you pay for in advance. And then they simply, through artificial invisible barriers like claims handling programs, as instituted and recommended by McKinsey and Company 30 years ago through Allstate, State Farm, and other carriers, these invisible barriers arise, and it's delay, deny, and then they defend it. It's called post-claim underwriting, Craig, and that's when they say, well, after the claim gets submitted and you make your claim, that's when the mischief begins. Then the delay begins, and as Warren Buffett said when he bought Geico, he said he never realized how much money he could make playing the float. Well, that's where the insurance people go. So if you break down the premium dollar where the money really goes and their subrogation and their investment arms, they're making a pretty penny here by deliberately delaying and denying payments. And that's not on every occasion, but you'll see that as kind of a cultural institutional value. Slow it down. And that's unfortunately what happens to insurers who are vulnerable and fragile and at their worst when they have to make a claim, and then they get re-victimized by being accused of falsifying claims. How do we do it? We one claim at a time. When you see these carrier ads like Liberty, 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 and Progressive, it all dates from all states, little scheme in the early 80s to say, well, hit me, I need the money. That all, you know, that little uh, bumper sticker. Then they use this bogus of, you know, litigation explosion to justify, quote, tort reform, which is actually subsidizing the wrongdoers. It's like the criminals whining that we need to soften the blows of sentencing. It's too hard. It's too cruel. Well, that's a bunch of uh, BS as well. So anyway, we're getting back into the insurance no, no, issues that, and that, what we're that, looking This at. is fascinating, and I think it's relevant on so many different levels. Um, and then oh, right. the, the insurance companies take those excess profits and they can funnel it to politicians who write laws that uh, include tort reform, that limit the ability to recover. So the consumer gets hurt in all sorts of ways. But when did this dawn on you? While you were president of the Civil Defense Bar or was it a gradual awakening? And is that why you left? Well, you realize over time, I mean, I still respect my partners at White and Steel tremendously. I've got no bad words, and I won't. I consider them among the finest out there. And it's not just a great culture of reawakening. I'm not Neo being unplugged from the Matrix. It's a matter we realize that there is an imbalance of power. And what can we do to try to equalize this here? I'm not Denzel Washington. I'm not, you know, saying I am in any respect. But maybe the knowledge I've acquired after 40 years can help those insureds out there who could probably use help. Because after all, Craig, if they could do it themselves, they wouldn't need lawyers, would they? And then when I run into lawyers whining and screaming about it, you go, wait a minute. We're firefighters. Why are we beefing about the smoke? Get in there. Roll up your sleeves. Let's get at it. And this is across genders. The diligent, competent, capable dedicated, most of the lawyers are women, and that's been the biggest change I've noticed in 41 years, is the emergence of women in both the civil and defense bar, and they have improved it immeasurably, in my humble opinion. I only wish that um, every civil case could have a woman lawyer in it, because they're not only analytical, detailed, human, um, but incredibly... uh, the word isn't ferocious, but uh, persistent, resilient. Um, you've noticed that, too, with the yeah, uh, rise. Yeah, of- you must be married to one. I've read your bio. You say your wife catches bigger fish than you. And I like women, too, but you're talking to a man here. And the reason well, I'm my ta- wife is in the other room here, and she's not a lawyer. She's a human being. She's well, a even civilian, better. Even a speech better. pathologist, an audiologist, and thank God her experience with brain damage people at Craig and Swedish helps her cope with me. But we've only been married 45 years to each other, so it, what do we know? If you want a stipulation that women are better, you've got it, okay? But thank the you. reason I have you on is a lot of people talk about being a trial lawyer, but you are a trial animal. How many Colorado trials have you participated in? You know, I just don't have a clicker. I don't know. 
it's been a number. So the same thing as when I go fishing, my goal is to get a number, and that's it. I'd like it to be a positive integer. What's an average here? What, well, uh, hey, here, I'll do the math. You've been doing it over 40 years. So back in the day when I was at Denver DA, we'd have, I'd have 10 or 12 trials a year. No way can you do that in civil. But I'm wondering about you as an insurance defense lawyer. It kind of flows like a prosecutor's office. So have you done hundreds of trials? I wouldn't say that. I'm not going to brag on that, Craig. I really don't know. I'll just say I've had a number, more than 10. Um, and thank God they don't ask, do I have to win them all? Because otherwise I'd have never gotten into the Aboda chapter. All right, you're being modest. You're being modest. But the point is, I'm still going to offer you as an expert because you are the head of an organization that champions juries. And boy, do I believe in the jury system, even when I've suffered through 11 to 1 mistrials. But juries really generally work hard, and it's a miracle of the American system. It's not perfect, but it's better than anything else, and it's really better than our political system right now. It's it's democracy in action. You would agree you're expert enough to sing the praises of the jury system. Not only that, Craig, but circle September 5 on your calendar, because now Every September 5 is Jury Appreciation Day in the state of Colorado, thanks to the efforts of our Aboda chapter, directed by former President Brad Ross Shannon. He and us and others on the committee, and I was privileged to serve with him, we managed to persuade the governor and the other brave legislators to sponsor a bill, and now we have it. Jury Appreciation Day every September 5. So we should sit back and thank the jurors profoundly, because they've been preempted and co-opted into being unpaid members of the Colorado judiciary, without which we couldn't function. Now, you got some big verdicts lately. You're clearly not here to brag or be that flamenco dancer, but explain that big verdict you just got that hit the news. Uh, Horrible uh, collision, bicycle, as I recall, but do brag on yourself. I insist. Well, not me. I was co-counsel with Megan Hoffman. Megan's a cyclist, learned a professional cyclist. We represented Mike Inglis, a true American hero, special ops, puts his life on the line, parachutes behind enemy lines, rescues our pilots, drags them across. He's got a chest full of ribbons, rescued his own best friend from certain death in a night dive in Lake Mead. The man is an absolute pillar of the community. His wife, Gwen, got killed by a meth addict at 1030 on a Sunday morning when they're training for a ride. Together, they shared seven national cycling titles, including two of the United States Military Tandem Cycling Championships. And of course, Mike, Mike Inglis, a true American hero at the Air Force Base at Buckley, he held the best conditioning award there and the only one to feed him with his Mets was his wife, Gwen. And, of course, Gwen's father was a pastor, and they religiously spent Sundays at the church. When Mike is serving in the military, Gwen is serving at the Sunday school for the kids. And when Mike retired in January, five months before this tragedy, he retired so he and Gwen could serve USOs across the country. They know how lonely service people are. So only five months after this. This gentleman who had spent the weekend snorting five grams of methamphetamine so he could gamble at the Central City Casinos, alleges he fell asleep at the wheel and killed Gwen. 50 feet in the air by the time Mike, a paramedic, gets to her. And Joe Snurka, she's bleeding from her ears. They're trying to rescue. They breathe life into this poor woman, but they couldn't rescue her. And what's Mike to do? The entire pillar of his life is gone. He looks around, and then he sees this motor is kind of edging toward the driver's door, and he says, you get away from there. And he made the guy go to the back of the car, and then the waterworks started. Boo ho ho The guy started feeling sorry for himself. Anyway, long story short is the jury, and again, it's not about lawyering. It's about the heroic jurors. The jurors said, we're going to take a stand. We're not going to put up with this in Jefferson County. If you're an impaired driver and this clown had his driver's license suspended five times, one, he got ticketed for DUI a week before this. 
why he's behind the wheels beyond me and why he only got eight years from the judge for the criminal, I don't know. Craig, you know the good time and earn time statutes. This joke will be on the street next calendar year, 2025, year and a half. Gwen's dead. What's Mike going to do now? So anyway, the jury said, no, we've had it. So Mike got $100 million of grief, $3 million for the money Gwen would have made as a CPA. And then the jury hit him with $250 million in punitives. Now, of course, the meth addict is unemployed. He's never going to have a W-2. He's going to get three hots on the cot for the rest of, you know, for the next of his sentence. He doesn't have to worry about paying for this. We know what it is. And then the nerve, he had the nerve to try to reduce it down to $100 million, saying, well, you know, you got to bring it down. So we filed a motion with Judge Carruthers, who bravely said, no, we're taking a stand. We're going to triple that as the statute allows. So now the verdict is $403 million. And now they're appealing it. Appealing it said the judge abused his discretion. So we're fighting that on appeal. So who knows what's going to happen? The guy had the minimum coverage allowed by law. Mike puts every nickel that into a foundation for Gwen. He won't see a penny. We essentially did it, Megan and I, on a pro bono basis. Ron Wilcox, a skilled appellate lawyer, is handling the appeal for us. Ron's another journalist, by the way, from the University of Montana. And he was ordered the coif. Not me. I was lucky to finish in the top 90% of my law class, but that's another story. Who's paying for the appeal on the other side? Well, we're not sure what the organization is. He was insured by Century Dairyland. And, of course, they did, they offered their 25000 in coverage long ago. That will barely cover Mike's costs in the case. So it's not a profit venture. Mike did that because he wanted to take a stand out there to say, maybe we can discourage other disabled, distracted, and impaired drivers. Maybe this jury will let them know before they take that last drink or the last vape or the last snort. Please don't do that before getting behind the wheel. Oh, man. That's you, Mike's you, purpose. You could have been a great prosecutor. And maybe it's not too late, even though you're in the Act 5 inner sanctum. It's still, have you ever thought about that? Because you get wound up on people getting victimized. Innocent I'd people. love to do it, but nobody's had the bad choice to even ask me to do it. I'd love to be a special prosecutor. Well, why don't you move to uh, Douglas County and run against Brockler? They have an opening. Ooh. Are you a Democrat? We'll get into politics in a little bit. Anyway. I well, I'm think, like yeah. Rick Blaine said, I'm a drunkard, so I don't know what to say to him. Uh, well, if he, are you drunk all the time? Well, actually, I almost a teetotaler, Craig. I was just being tongue-in-cheek. Oh, okay. I, well, I didn't know. You gave a great speech. Or, or, have, yes. Our, our point is that trials in America work. Just a slight diversion, because I've been watching these guys who wrote this book called The Tyranny of the Minority about how America's politics are messed up, our constitution's out of whack, especially the Electoral College. We've got policies coming out of our Supreme Court that the majority of people don't want, outsized influence to places like Wyoming, et cetera. You're a smart guy. You're in your fifth decade practicing law. My late brother... Gosh, I don't think he made it to his fifth decade. You know, some Pretty of us don't. You know, he was a great lawyer, and he said to me while he was hurting, I'm not sure that our system's working anymore. What, what say you, Rich Cotty? I've heard that before. I take a more optimistic approach. I think it works great. And to quote Ed Harris from Apollo 13, I think we're going to see our finest hour because we have very courageous and brave jurists and jurors and judges and lawyers willing to put down their gauntlets and say, no, we're going to stand up for what's right. Sure, we have minority tyranny, so to speak. Who said the South lost the Civil War? You can see that historically. The South has always had an overwhelming um, power through the Senate, through the Congress, through the judiciary. We know that there are unelected people on the Supreme Court we know we have unelected people here. We've got to support our institutions. I might not agree with these people, but I'm no philosopher king. I want to believe in the right of precedent and trust in our institution. I think we're going to come through this stronger. 
once we broom out these demagogues who are currently infecting our our, uh, judicial, not our judicial system, our electoral system, I think we'll be okay. So I take a more optimistic view. I think we're going to come through this just fine. And those authors do too. But we just have to survive this trial, so to speak, right now. And what worries me about the Old South rising again, you know, we kicked their ass before, we can do it again, but then I look up at Butte, Montana, and uh, Casper, Wyoming, and and Idaho, and I say, "Uh uh-oh, the South has allies, maybe Ohio. I didn't do it. Huh? <laughs> you kicked out the Ku Klux Klan when they showed up there, same as Kerry Nation. They kicked their ass out nice, of there. He's nice. the Democratic stronghold and always has been. Yeah, but Greg Gianforte is the uh, governor. He gets any yeah, office he wants after he beat that reporter, Ben Jacobs. It was a big talk show topic when I did that. And I said, it's bullshit. He broke his glasses. That's, right. it, That's huh? not beautiful. But it is Jim Montana the, politics. He's, he's mining uh, Montana Mag- voted MAGA big time. Of course, yeah, but not Butte. Neither did Missoula. Okay, I don't know Butte, and I know Missoula is a liberal sanctuary, but I'm talking Montana. I'm talking Anaconda or wherever they, they do the mines. Those people out there, and, and hey, Bobertville in Colorado, you are more in touch with that. Well, what's going on with these people? Why, why are they digging MAGA? I don't understand it either. That's beyond me. The best part about Montana is the, uh, right, is the fishing rights. But- uh, let me suggest this. We know this about the Old South. They didn't want black people. They wanted uh, white Christianity to dominate, right, in their way of doing things. So is that what's going on in Idaho? It seems there are a lot of white supremacists and and a lot of people just reluctant to change. They see uh, their country changing, and it just gets down to bigotry in a lot of ways, don't you think? Well, sadly, yeah. That's what Ellen Berg died for on the cross of bigotry in Colorado. We're sad to say it. And West and North, Northern Idaho has always been an Aryan Nations group. We knew that. There are pockets of it. Right. Even Montana, I think the John Birch Society was strong in Missoula one time in the 50s. But it evolves. What we're doing is a natural, I think the Scottish government calls it devolution. Have we devolved so that our culture is now embracing ignorance as a civic virtue, where we substitute stupidity for science? I don't think so. I think historically we go through these peaks and valleys. We've gone through the great, you know, emancipation. But I agree with you, the South, the old South should be ashamed you want the South to rise again? I don't. Look at the flags they embrace of Nazism and Confederacy. The flags of losers. Are you out of your mind? We want to stamp out that fort of bigotry. That's why we had Eisenhower among the greatest Republicans out there. Look what he did. He was fighting fascism. He was fighting for democracy. That's kind of what Spencer Tracy was trying to promote in Jur- Judgment at Nuremberg. Let's get back to basic human Values that our Constitution guarantees for everybody, not just simply certain, you know, classes of people. And thanks for bringing up Lauren Boebert, that poor woman. Got to admire her for uh, cheating you know, like Maslow's self-actualization. She peaked. She's fought through struggles. She's got her GED. And God knows it was probably challenging with the low light at Buell Theater to read that fine print in the program where it says, don't vape and don't record. Her lips were probably real tired by that point. She couldn't get to it. So let's, you know, get some understanding. She was just busting out to have a good time on the town. And, you know, I'm sorry it went that way for her. We appreciate her investing in Denver. Frankly, keep Denver green, Lauren, bring money. Some people talk about Denver and decay. It sure was that night. And as a trial lawyer, all the questions that leapt to mind. Already the Daily Mail has identified her boyfriend. Or I don't know. Her date as a guy, I think, Quinn Gallagher, a divorced guy who owns a bar in Aspen. Good luck with that. I think it's called Hooch or something like that. Anyway, she was dressed like she was going to Glendale instead of Denver. And then... I just wondered where they dined in Denver before they got there. What was in that glass that he took with them with the straw in it? And then I'd like all the sound. The incident report produced by the Colorado Sun was pretty darn sweet. 
And then did you see when they were going out toward 14th Street? She did a little twirl as she held the guy's hand. She was proud of the encounter, apparently. I would have been mortified. Holy cow, I'm going to be on the news now. But she was dancing like uh, my fair lady. And then the Denver Post this morning uh, had an editorial interviewing the pregnant woman in front of her who said, I asked her nicely. And then they offered to buy her a drink to make up for it. She said, I'm pregnant. And then yeah, when I asked, sure it, 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 I mean, they're great pro-life people, right? But what was she vaping, Rip, Rich Cotty? What, what, what would be the substance that would be so important to do it right there at the seat? Is that just nicotine? I don't know. She's a, going to be a single mom. You know, she's out there probably grieving the death of her divorce, thinking about her children. I'm just out there uh, probably trying to get some emotional support by seeing something here. What else could she have been doing, Craig, other than grieving the loss of her marriage? I know. And then, um, thank God it was a warm night because uh, she was not fully dressed. And uh, there was nobody really knew who she was. And then she put out a tweet a la Donald Trump, but we have to go in that direction because... She's been to Mar-a-Lago many times. I don't know if that's standard behavior down there. Probably vaping is fine. Sean Hannity does it. But the bottom line is she was in Denver. Does this hurt her on the Western Slope? She may be finished after this, don't you think? Well, she's got a retirement. She's visited the uh, Republican version of Berkus Garden over in Mar-a-Lago. She's been to the bunkers. She's seen it. And uh, she's been a loyal, card-carrying member of the new party that used to be the Republicans. And uh, Republican Party values, sadly enough, appear to be missing. But, you know, uh, yeah, but, but it, 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 it could turn out, and honestly, a certain percentage of the population would believe it, that that uh, group that went to her sitting on that beautiful aisle seat in the orchestra... Those guys are part of the deep state Denver division. And she was on some special mission from Marjorie Taylor Greene, who just called her a little bitch. But we know that's cover for their friendship, born of impeaching uh, Joe Biden. Anyway, it's getting wacky. And I just want to turn it back to MAGA because she started tweeting out, Hey, I did get kicked out of Beetlejuice. It was a lot of fun. If anybody could tell me the ending. She's embracing the misconduct like the mega man, Donald Trump. I don't know your politics. Ike is a clue. I liked Ike. And he used to roam the streets of Denver to, co- to come play sure. golf. That's pretty cool. So uh, have, you been, have you been a Republican, a Democrat? Lay it all out in this Act 5 lounge. Well, to answer your compound question, yes. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I put in yes. With Eisenhower, we fished at Eisenhower's cabin. You're not calling uh, Representative Bobert an attention slut, are you? I uh, know, but I did last week call Jenna Ellis a fart target. That wasn't nice. I was quoting somebody else. I call her From Bobo Patrick online. Yes. She's the one that her husband divorced her because she was having as they say, carnal knowledge with a weightlifting coach. I mean, these they're just human beings. They have weaknesses. We should embrace their weakness. Did you know yeah, Jenna, sorry, did... Jenna Ellis tweeted against Lauren Boebert saying how terrible it was? It's not Christian. I'm worried a lot of this comes down to white Christian nationalism. Populism I'm... is what it is. It's the same thing that was the 1923 Munich pooch in uh, the Munich Beer Hall, it evolved or devolved into that form of Christianity populism, and look where that ended up. It ended up in Auschwitz. So have you been voting? Want. Yeah, did not to avoid the question where you just said yes, but had you steadily voted Republican, and did you make the yes. mistake? Yes, been that- a registered Republican, registered Democrat, registered Independent. Like you, like many people, we vote for the quality of the candidate, not some cheap label smacked nice. on them. If yes. only the senators would go around like NASCAR drivers and have their labels of their sponsors, we'd know who in the hell is funding them. But they won't do that. You're like, like that's me. another real. Yeah, you wouldn't get off the fence. And I'm so stupid that I ran as an unaffiliated candidate saying, 
Politics and prosecution are a poor mix, but in truth, I couldn't really choose between the Democrats and Republicans. I had been a Democrat. There were things that turned me off. Thank God I never became a Republican, but the the bottom line is right now I am politically activated because it comes down to are you MAGA or are you anti-MAGA? And I am fully anti-MAGA. What about you, Mr. Cotty? Well, there's two ways to address that. One would be, are you in favor of autocracy, theocracy, and authoritarianism or not? And I'm not. Correct. When did it become apparent to you? Because Charlottesville was a big wake up for me. I think when that reality star fraud kind of trooped down the stairs, masquerading as a political candidate, even before he ran against Hillary Clinton and that entire pack of lies. I mean, let's face it, Trump is a bellicose, belligerent, bloviating brain, bullying buffoon, a longtime grifter, a sociopathic prevaricator, liar, lion king, coward, and slut for attention. He's grifted every time, and he's the best bullshit artist you'll run into. Why would we expect him to do anything else? Because he's conned everybody. He's got the murd touch Everything he touches turns to excrement, except selling red hats to the sheep that he's milking for dollars. A billionaire with a 747 bleating that he's poor and he needs your dollars? Oh, my God. And people fall for that. So he should just be called X. Don't call him former. Don't call him. Don't dignify him. He's an ex-president. And like many exes, we have issues with our ex. The biggest X I have is he's trying to attack the judiciary, he attacks the rule of law, and he attacks the foundations of our country. We can't see him broomed quickly enough by the ballot box like he was the last time. So, other than that, I don't have any hard feelings about this fraud. What about the the judicial system? He's got four indictments. You said the voters are going to save us. What do you think of... uh, Yeah, civil justice system and where he's got millions of dollars he's owed and he's stiffing everybody like he's done characteristically. Right. I mean, who else could bankrupt a casino but this functional fraud? Um, I don't know that. I'm very, um, do I agree with the judicial decisions? No, I think Dobbs is an absolute travesty. I think we need to deprive women of a fundamental right and human beings. Where does that stop? What's the next fundamental right to go? No, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Let let me focus my question because that wasn't good. I'm thinking about USA v. Trump. I'm thinking about Judge Chutkin and that trial coming up in March. I'm thinking about Sidney Powell and uh, Ken Cheesebro just set their trial for October 23rd in Atlanta. The jury system will be on display. There is also that civil case that Tish James is bringing in New York based on fraud. So exactly. I'm just thinking that before the voters get to him, I'd like to see him peppered about the head and the body with legitimate blows based on what he did and some judicial accountability would be nice so that he gets pounded in the next election. I can't predict what a jury will do. I don't hear the evidence. I don't know it's been excluded. I think the jurors will do their job as they're sworn to do. They take an oath just like you did, like soldiers do, like police officers do, like we do, to uphold the rule of law. And I trust the jury system. And if he gets acquitted, he gets acquitted. That's the way it goes. We let the chips fall, but at least we'll get the opportunity to be in the arena and let honesty and let let sunshine be the best disinfectant for whatever's infecting us. This gentleman seemed to be averse or even um, allergic to having jurors scrutinize him as if he's above it all, as if he's entitled to sit on this golden toilet that simply, uh, if anything, characterizes his entire character. Yeah, okay, let's bring it on here. Let's see if you're too important to be down with the rest of us. But the Constitution guarantees us justice for all. And let's see if this is going to be put into exercise. And then if he survives that, let's let the let the, the jurors vote for it on their ballots. Then we can take our ballot. Keep in mind the chaos he created during his four years of chaos when he simply wanted to disrupt the entire system. 
when he wanted to get rid of the mail system, he wanted to do all he can to clamp down on people voting. That's because he didn't have the fix in. That's why he's so peeved about it. And look at all of the disruptive materials he pulled when he was the president. It's just astonishing. Right, but he'll do more. The- now he's a fugitive, Rich, and that's just what I want you to contemplate because you are a serious litigator. You're used to getting those email alerts Oh, my God, they filed a motion for this. They want what? I have to respond by when. But Wouldn't they're... you love to get him under oath, Craig? Wouldn't you love just an hour with this clown under oath? I know, but that's what I'm getting at is how will a judge deal with this guy? Because he'll never willingly go under oath. He told Hugh Hewitt, yeah, I'll testify. They'll fight with every motion. Already he's threatening the prosecutor. He's threatening the judge. I wrote a column that they need to hold their fire, write them all down, charge them eventually with that shit too, but keep your eyes on getting this done. But I'm not the final authority. This guy's going to try to wreck the rule of law in America and wreck the judicial process of USA v. Trump and Georgia v. Trump just as surely as I'm talking to you. Smarter people than you and I are in control of this and I look at Jack Smith and Judge J- and Letitia James and all the judges, they've got the intellectual quotient and the caloric energy and the staff behind them. We've got 250 years of tradition. One Mount Bank like this is not going to tear us down. He can do his best, but as Patrick Henry would, you know, intone, <laughs> we, we're going to go after him. Oh, and that's boy. not his Okay, purpose. now, did you just insult us as Act 5 attorneys? We're over the hill, or we never had that fastball? Or the point I hope you're making is, hey, it's not Rich Cotty Law, Craig Silverman Law, we're talking about the biggest, most well-staffed, talented law firm in the world when you're talking about DOJ and the resources available to Jack Smith. Fonnie Willis is smart, to James, too, and they have huge resources and staff. I'm hoping that's what you meant. Well, I, if I came through clumsy, it just shows my lack of training. And you're I'm not, not an clumsy. erudite person. I'm you not eloquent what? except when I got my mouth shut. But I think there's some huge brains out there, a lot smarter people out there than he's equipped with. He's an incoherent boob anyway. He can't even put together a simple sentence without meandering, like the dance of the mayfly. Logic has left his mind. Truth will never escape his lips. But the Department of Justice and others in other state governments are very, very bright people. We have very bright special prosecutors in the civil arena They're going to put that firepower. He's going to be running for cover. He doesn't have Roy Roy Cohn or his other henchmen to to support him anymore. Yes, he does. He has Roy Roy Cohn types. I just don't think it'll work for him anymore. Not anymore. Roy Roy Cohn had an ignominious end, disbarred. So it falls apart at the end, I hope so. Do you know what the end of that? country is much stronger than one claim self-proclaimed billionaire in tax fraud, according to Letitia James. I just have some unbelievable confidence in the strength and integrity of our judicial system. Every time you run into a judge, thank them, shake their hand and say, God knows the work they do and the jurors they do, that they don't get rewarded enough. And I'm only saying that for pandering, of course. But all I'm saying is when you did into well, my old former law partner, Cajardo Lindsay, African-American, inner-city ghetto from Cincinnati. He's now a district court judge at Arapahoe County's bench, and he faces this all the time. So that's what we have to cope with. He's a highly skilled person in his own right. But I don't need to get into that because he was captain of his football team at uh, Miami of Ohio. And he worked for the NFL. I don't need to praise Cajardo, but I know these Judge Lindsay, as he's now known, these guys... These ladies of the of the bench and men, they work tirelessly. And they get second-guessed every decision they get. They're going to be angering one side or the other. Of course I'm irritated. Of course I lose my sense of decisions. But the integrity of the judicial bench in this state, I think, is unparalleled nearly anywhere else. Well, we're going to find out because two of the biggest cases are pending here. Eric Coomer versus Donald Trump, Randy Corcoran, can you ask Salem? Michelle Malkin, sure. Rudy Giuliani. That is pending, but even bigger is the declaratory judgment 
And I want to talk to you about that because you've done more of those than I ever would think of doing. A declaratory sure. judgment, Anderson v. Griswold, Norma Anderson and five other plaintiffs suing Jenna Griswold, saying the 14th Amendment Clause 3 says this guy can't run. He's an insurrectionist. And he doesn't even have to be an insurrectionist. insurrectionist. Who decided the case? Who's the judge? You know, I heard the name. It's just somebody like Mason. Or I didn't even know if it was a man or a woman. Is it Ender? Well, they're trying to remove it or they're not. But the bottom line... No, no, Brimmer won't let him do it because Jenna Criswell won't agree to remove it. He denied that motion. I just okay. wonder what state court... Did, did you know which, Phil, which Phil Brimmer? Yeah, Phil Brimmer was my deputy when I was a chief. Hey, it's, you're right. It went back to Denver District Court. I don't know, but it's going to be big and it could move fast, right? A declaratory judgment. There's no jury well, trial. Have, well, Seven, we get it. You cast a judicial declaration, but if either side asks for a jury, you get an advisory jury. You do. I've got one of those right now in federal oh. court. Love to do that. I want my advisory jury to hear all that stuff. So I hope somebody has the good sense to say we want six to seven tried and true jurors sitting in on it to oh. advise the court. That's interesting. Send me a link. I'll put that in the show notes. But I do have to come back to the one time you bragged during this whole interview. You're so humble. Do you know when it I was? I got a lot to be humble about, Craig. Do you know when it was you bragged and I need the details? When I was an editor of the Montana Kaiman? It was close to that. Yeah, when you won that AP Writing Award. What was it for? That was 1977 from the Montana AP on a, my article called Magneto Hydrodynamics. What is that? I'm glad you asked. It's how to generate electricity using magnets. Came out of Butte, Montana, Montana Energy Research and Development Institute, founded by Jerry Plunkett from the University of Denver. But anyway, that's long ago. What was, there, what was it about the article that caught everybody's attention? I think the uh, subject and predicates matched. <laughs> I bring it up but because my boss, the uh, Grand Poopa at the Colorado Sun, Larry Rickman, is the other guest on this episode 170, oh. and he worked for the AP for decades. So this sort of an Associated Press-related show. Well, Hugh, Swan, Hugh Van Swearingen was the AP chief up in Montana when I was up there, and this was 76 through 78 that I reported. And there's real culture in the AP. You guys are, give me the facts. There's a certain way to identify AP types, and it, it's a good quality. Give us the facts. We'll report them, right? That, well, we only hope that now. Instead, we, we straight to the New York Times style of writing, which I find despicable. It's the little Jimmy and little Janie. Well, little Jimmy got this and little Janie got that. Get to the freaking point. I have to read five paragraphs down to know who, what, when, where, why. Get to the point, summarize it, and then talk about little Jimmy, little Jenny, but don't stray. And that's what I liked about the AP. They get to the point. Anyway, that's my rant on journalism. Oh, boy. That's why it's perfect pairing you and Larry Rickman. I can't thank you enough for your time, Rich Cotty. I hope you had as much fun as I did. We opened up the uh, Act 5 Attorney's Inner Sanctum of Craig's Lawyer's Lounge. And uh, Tom Overton helped make it happen. You know, he told me you would be great in the lounge. And boy, was he right. He's pretty smart, isn't he? Yeah, Tom succeeded me as the chapter president now. Tommy's a hard worker. And uh, when I used to do journalism, I'd end up my story with the guy saying, hey, don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I understand that. Just to my final question is, don't you think attorneys have a special obligation right now to speak out yes and don't you think really it's act five attorneys because if you were trying to make it at a law firm you might be a little more careful in using the rhetoric he used against the guy who might be president again well i just we read new york times versus sullivan again and i think if anything we need to speak louder we need to be more vocal. I know, but what if, what if one of your senior partners at White and Steel is a MAGA guy? I bet that might be true. Other way around. Other way around. There, none of them Not, are MAGA? Well, I haven't been at White and Steel. No, nobody, nobody in the insurance defense world that you were so proud supports MAGA? Don't some people put corporate profits ahead of uh, things like 
I don't know. Democracy. Some do. Yeah. So and, no, and some do. Right. And some prosecutors do. Community. I don't speak for everybody. No, we don't I, have one I, bullhorn. I don't either. Same with the CTOA. There's some minority members that are highly conservative too. And I'm As just saying, if you if you're picking a jury in Jeffco and you just did, and somebody might look you up and say, "Oh my God, Rich Cotty, episode 170." I'm mega. I don't like this guy. And the last thing you want to do is jeopardize the ability of your client to do well. Do you see what I'm saying? There are just are some people in the corporate world or just to pay their mortgage and not make waves. They have to stay away from talking about this. That's why I think it's important that people like you and I at our stage of life, and maybe we would have always done it, but I feel a little more free to do it now. I don't know about you. Let's face it, we all agree with Henry David Thoreau, that government is best which governs least, but we don't have that luxury right now, because we all don't have the same set of shared values we once did. I agree, and let's for the record say that even though you tried to make yourself younger than me by graduating in 82 instead of 81, but you took that time three years writing and winning awards, so you're a little older than me. Uh, it sounds that way. I'm an angry, angry old man, you know, with a cane at the rocking chair. But I was born in my favorite year, 1954. Well, then the year that followed. And we got to know each other, I think, on the basketball court, Lawyers League. I mean, we didn't know each other well because I tended to depersonalize. Uh, the well, you were team. Mr. Elbows and Mr. Hips and Mr. Knees, as I recall. Mr. And you Tree. were never... Sh- never uh, Subtle about making note that when somebody else elbowed you, you'd call that to our attention. Well, you had a big goon on your team, isn't he? The big, where's he at? Wheeler Trig now, or who was that guy? Mike is a, Mike O'Donnell's one of the finest lawyers I've ever met in a great tradition. He was president of the American College of Trial Lawyers. He's a member of the American Board of Trial Advocacy, um, Federation of Insurance and Corporate Counsel, Notre Dame graduate, fast Serve. He won the Denver Bass Serve Contest. Mike has got incredible skills. What, in He's tennis? An right, but in basketball, and... how big is that guy? You're saying that I was doing stuff? Explain what that guy was doing to me. Well, Mike was six foot six, and from Notre Dame, you knew he was angelic, and he spends most of his time washing the feet of the poor and the homeless. And when he wasn't doing that and setting the cornerstone for the Church of the Little Sisters of the Poor, he was fending off your elbows going down the lane for the Lawyers League. Okay, it sounds to me like he will listen to this podcast and maybe come on to speak up for himself. He can. Mike is, like I said, the top head and shoulders, the most ethical integrity guy I've ever run into. You never find him being the flamenco dancer. Mike is humble, and he's a gifted man, great writer, incredible in front of a jury, as you would probably, well, if he did criminal, you'd run into him. Mike is a talented, gifted man. Can't say enough about him. What about that elbow he planted in my temple that one time? Do you remember that? You earned it, and actually you invited it, as I remember. Maybe, maybe. Anyway, (laughs) I have an endless list of people, and he's probably in his fifth decade, so he could come in the Act Five's inner sanctum of Craig's Lawyer's Lounge. This has been special for me, Rich Cotty. I hope you liked your first podcast. I sure did. Well, thank you for being gentle with me. Just like on the basketball court. Yeah, Mr. Elbow himself. But that's fine. We give as good as we get. Like in trial, evidence is tested as it arises. Absolutely. You've tested me thoroughly, but you've stimulated (laughs) my mind. And I like that Montana stuff. And I'm going to get my oldest boy to listen because how many times do you talk about Marcus Daly on a podcast in Colorado, huh? Even worse, have him look up Leslie Fiedler, Columbia University professor who taught at the University of Montana. He wrote the seminal article called The Montana Face. And tell him, you talk with a guy that's got the Montana face, you go, what? Yeah, well, it's a, fe- a face suited chiefly for looking into the wind. Holy cow. This is good <laughs> stuff. Until next time, Rich Cotty. I can't thank right. you enough. Take care. Thanks, Greg. See you later. Bye-bye. Michael, of course, is a great sponsor of my show, but more than that, he's my lawyer, my end-of-life planning lawyer, and I've got two dogs. What about you? I have two dogs right now as well. And not only do you love your dogs at home with your kids and your wife, but 
you get involved with dog issues in your law practice. Tell everybody about that. So I will write pet trusts, which is you can earmark money to take care of your pets. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, they've got their dogs and you know, they love their dogs. But then if somebody were to, you know, if, you're, if you were to pass away, you know, who's going to take your dogs? Who would, who would love your dogs as much as you do? I don't know that anybody would love your dogs as much as you do. But like I grew up with dogs. And so if I were to pass away, then my parents or my siblings could take the dogs. So when you set up a pet trust, you can dictate who's going to get those dogs and then who you can leave money to take care of the dogs as well. I like working with you and I think you are ahead of your time. You have 15 different locations. How cool is that? It's, it is nice to be able to go to all the different locations and you know meet people where it's comfortable and more convenient for them. And nobody wants to drive from one part of Metro Denver to the other to meet with a lawyer. You will come to them. Yep, and I'll deal with traffic so you don't have to. Tell us how people can get in touch with you. My direct phone number is 720-394-6887, or they can go to my website, which is mobileestateplanning.com. And again, that's mobileestateplanning.com. And there's even a schedule, you know, there's a book an appointment link on this on the website. All right, Michael Bailey, thank you. Okay, here's the thing. You've been hurt. Maybe, God forbid, someone's been killed. You don't know what to do. If it happened in Colorado, please get a hold of me. Check out my website, craigscoloradolaw.com. Craigscoloradolaw.com because I have four decades of experience. Sadly, I've helped a lot of people who have been hurt terribly through no fault of their own. 303-734-7156. Please call Craig. Craig Silverman, a voice for victims. 303-734-7156. Hey, did I tell you that would be great? How about that song? How about the concept? New Last Chance from our troubadour, Dave Gunders. God, he's talented. Then we had Larry Rickman, my boss, Colorado Sun. An AP guy. He knows journalism. He understands its role in democracy, and he explained it so darn well. Please come to the SunFest to hang out with me and Larry and a whole lot of other people. September 29th, tickets online. Speaking of online, would it kill you to give a nice review on Rosh Hashanah? Five stars on Apple would be nice. Or just give a click, a like on YouTube. You know, we don't do any video because I'm not dressed up right now. I got clothes on. I'm going to get dressed tomorrow for show, okay? Anyway, the sun is going down. It's Rosh Hashanah. Happy New Year. Please, Lord, make this one a good one. Thanks for listening. Tell a friend. Share. Subscribe. See you. Arab Yom Kippur. Bye. Thank you for listening. Tune in live every Saturday morning, 9 to noon, Mountain Time. Visit thecraigsilvermanshow.com for the podcast, blog, and more. Be sure to subscribe on all major podcasting platforms to be updated when new episodes are available. This has been The Craig Silverman Show.